Good morning. Welcome to the fourth Sunday of Advent. Glad you are uh, joining us today here at the in church uh, with the wonderful Christmas tree behind me. And this week, um, you see the wonderful nativity scene here and then the Advent wreath as well. Well, Christmas is almost here. Christmas Eve is just around the corner, and we are preparing ourselves very much to celebrate this new year of the celebration of the birth of our King, our Lord and our Savior. Remember, I want you to remember that uh, this coming uh, Christmas Eve, we were going to have an activity, a wonderful activity, of gathering together in the parking lot area around the church, Family Life Center. We're going to be lighting votive candles. We're going to be having little bags, and we're going to have an activity out there a little bit. We'll celebrate the birth of Christ. Because by golly, folks, no matter what has happened in 2020, we can still light the, 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 the light of God and celebrate his birth. No one can stop us. We are not being stopped. We're gathering together. It's social distancing, of course. We've heard that so many times. It's, it's sort of something that even I'm really tired of saying. And I'm sure you're all tired of hearing it as well. So, again, welcome to this wonderful new day. Lord has made the sun is shining, and uh, I'm going to begin our service this morning with the lighting of the Advent wreath. Okay? All right. Our fourth candle is the candle that we celebrate lifting up the love of God. Last week we lit the third candle, the candle of joy. And that's always a pink candle, and we like that. That's the candle of joy. Before that, we lit the candle of hope. And the candle of peace. Hope and peace. Today, we're going to be lighting the candle of love. We hear the angel voices. Scripture tells us the angels declare the coming, not only of Jesus himself, but of John the Baptist. The coming of Christ John. So today, we light the candle of hope. Let us continue for a moment in prayer. Loving God, we are sometimes unable to hear God's word for us because we are occupied with so many other things. Sometimes we do not hear because of the level of noise that we have created for ourselves. We pray for silence in our heart, in our mind, and let your spirit wash over our spirit. And may we find comfort, and most of all, your love, leading us and guiding us into this wonderful world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I've been thinking here the last week or two, and my wonderful wife and one of my good friends reminded me that I haven't appeared to be particularly perky, uh, cheerful. I've been kind of kind of down the doldrums, as one might say. And I must confess, they're right. It's been difficult. It's been difficult for all of us, and um, it's obviously been noticed on me as well, and I admit to it. You know, it's, it's difficult. We opened up for a while here to, to worship together in our wonderful sanctuary, and then all of a sudden, we're not able to do it again because of this uptick, as we have referred to it as. It gets hard on us. It gets hard on all of us when we're unable to gather together in the community, to be within distance of each other. But you know what? I have been strongly and greatly encouraged on different levels of media that I've watched periodically, like Facebook, I'll give you an example. That's a wonderful place where it's, it's been encouraging to see some of the things that I've seen from family and friends and church folks, too. Absolutely. Absolutely church. You know, there's this bah humbug. I've watched the Scrooge movies a couple of times already. Maybe you have as well. Bah humbug. It's understandable at this point in time. Bah humbug. But I have watched on Facebook. I've seen wonderful pictures on Facebook of people baking cookies, gathering together in their cook in their kitchens, and, and, and with a daughter or a son, and making cookies, making candy celebrating 
not allowing any of the outside forces to put a stop to this wonderful celebration. And we are not going to do that either. We are not going to allow anything to stop us from celebrating the birth of our King, our Lord, our Savior, because it is a glorious celebration. No matter what we might say to others or what we might think, the church is not closed. It's never been closed. It never will be closed. We do need to take cautious efforts, of course, to watch out for each other. But isn't that the whole purpose of the church, is to watch out for each other? When we see a brother or a sister stumbling, perhaps, we, we run up to them nearby, we grab them by the arm, and we help lift them up, and we walk with them. So in this whole process of, of making candy and making cookies and exchanging cards, exchanging phone calls, keep all that in mind, okay? Share the funny jokes and funny memes that, that uh, we, we talk about and um, enjoy some old movies. Uh, I've already seen little snippets of old movies that I like to watch this time of the year, uh, such as White Christmas and, and uh, It's a Wonderful Life, even a Rudolph uh, movie periodically and stuff like that. And then some of the new, new movies that come out, okay? There's a bunch of new ones coming out as well. So enjoy those times, okay? Please do that. And maybe even as, as one of our meetings I had recently, a Zoom meeting, I must admit, um, we even talked about some of the uh, other movies, a tra new tradition of Christmas, uh, such as Bruce Willis's Die Hard movie. It's a little bit questionable, of course, but it's still it's sort of become a strange twist on a Christmas celebration. But really, all of this wounds around and, and comes back to the purpose of this whole season. It is here the Advent wreath, it is here in the Nativity, and here it is represented in the Christmas tree behind it. But you know something about it. It's more than just a Christmas tree, my sisters and brothers. Much more than just a simple Christmas tree. It is actually a Chrismon tree. C-H-R-I-S-M-O-N. Chrismons. These are the symbols that you see behind me on the tree. They are symbols of the early church, the current church, the church forever. Symbols such as an anchor, indicating our anchor with God. Symbols of the cross, symbols of the fish. These were used by the early founders of our faith, which was called the way. Because they had to meet in secret. They had to meet in, in far off places that were hidden away from the common everyday law of the day, which didn't appreciate the faith that was being built around Christ Jesus. And so they created symbols such as these to indicate to their brothers and sisters where the next church meeting was going to happen, where the next gathering of the believers was going to happen. And that's why we lift up and we celebrate things such as this, a chrismon tree. Because we need to remember that when Jesus came, when his birth came about, it was a difficult time, not unlike the days we are living in right now, a difficult time for people. Now let's go back a little bit to a little bit of the story, shall we? In the Gospel according to St. Luke, we are told some different things that are occurring. First of all, the birth of John. John the Baptist is foretold. In chapter 1 of the Gospel according to St. Luke, in the days of Herod of Judea, there was a priest by the name of Zechariah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. But then, when Zechariah went to the sanctuary, an angel appeared to him and said, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and you will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. But Zechariah was questioning what was going on, and the angel took away his voice for a little bit. Unable to speak until the days of things would occur, is what the angel told him. Kind of a harsh occurrence, but that's what Scripture tells us. And then, after those days, Elizabeth conceived. For five months she remained in seclusion. Now, we are told of the foretelling of the birth of Jesus, also in the Gospel according to St. Luke. 
in chapter 2. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with thee. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Well, the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found great favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and you will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of your ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am yet a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, and her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her, who is said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. And then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now in those days Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah, and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and exclaimed with a loud cry out, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? As soon as the child heard, as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. These are some of the stories that come from the Gospel according to St. Luke, but there is more. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Neighbors and relatives heard the Lord had, done, had been great merciful to her. On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child as was the custom. They were going to name him Zechariah after his father, but his mother said, No, he is to be called John. But they said to her, But none of the relatives have this name, which was the tradition. And they began to motion to the father to find out what name he wanted to give to him. And he wrote on a tablet, for his voice had not yet been restored. His name is John. All of them were amazed at what he wrote. And immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue freed, and he began to speak and to praise God. These are amazing stories that we need to embrace in a way that is sometimes different than we choose to do today. It's not just the fairy tale stories of our secular world. This is an amazing story of the commitment of our God to us. That he would send to us a great prophet by the name of John, John the Baptist, to declare that we are prepared a way for the birth of our Lord and King. And so we remember on days like this, weeks like this, most particularly now in this era of change, dramatic change, that has worn heavy upon all of us. We are still in the midst of it, and yet we can see the brightness of a light that has come, the brightness of the light of Christ Jesus. And more than that, the brightness and the light of our sisters and brothers of the faith who have and are reflecting a great joy and a celebration. I ask you to work with me that we shall declare this new world that has come, that is coming, through the work that we do for the people of God that are all around us who need to hear because they have been heavy, heavily burdened with so much. And we understand it. You know, I said earlier, and I'm sure some of you have felt it as well, it has become a time sometimes of, of going bah, bah, but we have, and we have a revival within our hearts that is available with this light of hope. Now again, I invite you to the Christmas Eve gathering in the Family Life Center parking lot. Come, light a, a votive candle, 
and hear the Christmas music and look upon the scene of the celebration of the birth of our King. For it is time to celebrate once more this wonderful gift. bring up some of these things to you that one of our great prophets of our modern age by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, many of you have heard of him. If you have not, I would invite you to read some of his works, some of his books. Well, there was a message that Dietrich Bonhoeffer preached in the town of Barcelona, Barcelona, Spain, in 1928, that he spoke about the emotions of this season that we are in. And in 1928, he said, it is remarkable that we face the thought that God is coming so calmly, whereas the previous peoples trembled at the day of God. We have become so accustomed to the idea of divine love and of God's coming at Christmas that we no longer feel the shiver of fear that God is coming to arouse in us. We're indifferent to a message taking only the pleasant, only the agreeable out of it, and forgetting the serious aspects that the God of the world has drawn near to us, our little earth, and has laid plain to us once more. Now, it wasn't that Bonhoeffer was making any of that up. Although his sermon didn't specifically mention a prophet by the name of Malachi, it sounds very much like what Malachi wrote long, long before. He wrote in the book of Malachi, in chapter 3, that I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. The Lord, whom you will seek, will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soap, and he will sit as a refiner and the purifier of silver. He will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and in former years. And indeed, you and I are that person. We are being refined every single day of our lives. There are things that need to be burnt off. There are things that need to be taken away from us because they are not in the fullness of the reflection of the love of God. And that's what we are talking about today, the love of God. Now, I remind you once more, my sisters and brothers, behind me on this wonderful Christmas tree are the Christmas, symbols of the day that the people truly recognized that they needed to hide this message from the powers that be, because the powers that be were jealous of this great power, this great power of love, this great power of care for all people, not just particularly people, one person or another person, one group or another group, but for all people. And it is that spirit that I want to conclude the message for today from a little story that I came across and you may have heard about already. From Alan Abramski in Roanoke, Texas, years ago, in a cultural exchange program, they hosted a rabbi from Russia at Christmas time, this time of the year. They decided to introduce the rabbi to a culinary treat that was probably not available in his country at the time. They took him to their favorite Chinese restaurant. Now, throughout the meal, the rabbi spoke excitedly about the wonders of North America in comparison to the conditions of his own homeland. Now, when they finished eating, the waiter brought the check, presented each one of them with a small brass Christmas tree, an ornament, a Christmas tree ornament, as a seasonal gift. Well, they all laughed. And then when Bromsky's father pointed out the ornaments were stamped made in India and everyone laughed and yet suddenly the laughter began to subside when they noticed that the rabbi was actually not laughing the rabbi was in tears he was crying 
Concerned, Abramski's father asked the rabbi if he was offended because he'd been given a Christian gift on a Christian holiday. And the rabbi smiled. And he shook his head. He says, no, no. This is a wonderful place. More than what I even could imagine. In which a Buddhist could give a Jew a Christmas gift made by Hindu. Now what he meant by that, of course, is a Chinese restaurant run by a Buddhist gave a Jewish rabbi a Christmas gift. A Christmas gift that was stamped, made, I wanted to share that particular little story as the ending of this message. Because doesn't that reflect what we have here? The Christmas tree behind us, all the different symbols. The Advent wreath, the symbol of love and care for a world that needs to understand the depth of the true love of God for all humanity. We all need our church that has been called to that work. All of us together. We may not have been able to meet in person for quite a while, but we will once more. But we are able to meet, wonderfully meet, over the gift of technology. As much as that technology frustrates me and maybe frustrates you as well, I know it does me, I'll admit that. I'm watching a telephone as I talk. I see Sam Beerman with me, but still, I'm talking to a telephone. And I have to imagine you, my friends, you, my, my church family, and my other family all around. Because without you, without all of us together, we are just not complete. My friends, as we conclude our service of the day, I want to finish with a word of prayer, shall we? Loving God, we give you thanks for this beautiful day that you've given to us. Another day to sing glory to your wonderful name, to let others know about the love and the care that you have for us. The love and the care that we have seen reflected and given to us most clearly in Christ Jesus. We ask you to be with us this day as we go about the work that we are called to do. Caring for each other, watching out for each other, working together to glorify your holy name. And help us to stand together, work together, and hold each other up as we walk together into this wonderful world that God has given to us. Bless us this day. Guide us this day in the hope of Christ. Hope of Christ Jesus who has taught all of us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, dear friends, I'd ask you to go in grace, go in peace, go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We will see you on Christmas Eve, on another wonderful, beautiful day that God has given to us. Peace be with you all.